So uh, just broadly, this is the overview of the presentation this evening. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about variables that matter to treatment outcomes. Uh, second, I'm going to talk about the process of training the mind. We often talk about outcomes of uh, training the mind. I'm going to talk about the process. When I say training the mind, uh, I am actually uh, distinguishing it from mindfulness training. Mindfulness training being one way of training the mind. Um, I'm going to be talking about training the mind in Buddhism. Uh, the third, outcomes of training the mind, uh, individual outcomes, and mindfulness, moving on to mindfulness and interpersonal behavior, so the associations between those two. And then lastly, uh, perhaps the more subtle influences uh, that one person's mindfulness practice can have on another person. So into this section, factors meaningful to treatment outcomes. Uh, the hypothesis here is that mindfulness is a core therapeutic skill that can be developed and which has influence on variables which matter to treatment outcomes. And I'm not going to try and get into uh, a discussion this evening so much about how much these variables I'm going to be talking about, therapeutic alliance and empathy, matter to treatment outcomes. But I am going to make the case that they do matter to treatment outcomes. Uh, therapeutic alliance, this is just um, some studies, listing some studies showing the association between uh, strong therapeutic alliance and uh, positive treatment outcomes. The alliance between the psychologist and the patient, the most researched common factors, so these are often called common factors, the harder to dissociate and study uh, within controlled studies. The most researched common factor has been found to be a robust predictor of outcome um, in this meta-analysis by Hobart and uh, Betty. And also uh, Baldwin and colleagues conducted a study and they found that alliance variance was primarily accounted for by differences between therapists. And uh, so it was less related to what the patient's role was in creating the alliance. It was more uh, individual differences in the therapist's capacity to develop an alliance. And lastly, that high impact sessions, sessions that uh, create immediate positive benefits for the client, uh, often involve a strong therapeutic alliance. And uh, empathy being the next, uh, it's long been recognized as a critical component of psychotherapy. And um, empathy, and the subject of many studies, and empathy, uh, as Bohart and colleagues found, may account for at least as much variance as type of treatment used. And uh, Bohart and colleagues go on to suggest that empathy may be more important in intervention-based treatments than in relational-based treatments. And moreover, empathy has been shown to be a capacity of the mind that can be developed, which is crucial to what we're talking about tonight. Um, so again, you know, there's disagreement on this topic, how much uh, variance empathy accounts for. But just to present one perspective, that empathy uh, may account for at least as much variance as type of treatment being used. So in summary of this sh rather so short section, uh, it has been suggested that many clinical training programs lead the development of uh, mental skills, such as empathy and attention, up to chance. So what we're doing this evening and what we're doing with training the mind, perhaps, is attending to the omissions of clinical training. And um, that's not to knock clinical training programs in any way, but just to say that there might be other ways that we can develop ourselves on the side or uh, in groups like this that actually benefit our clients as well. And um, but how do we go about teaching and training students? Um, and these factors that influence capacities for empathy, relationship, and therapeutic alliance. So at Naropa University, like I said, training the mind is central to uh, clinical training. And um, so in this next section, I'll be talking about ways in which that occurs in Naropa, but also in the section talking about the process of training the mind and uh, the developmental process of contemplative development as well. So this relates to our work in the lab, um, focusing on uh, contemplative development, so this path of uh, uh, transformation that occurs as one is engaging in a contemplative practice or a contemplative path, specifically focusing on Buddhist mind training methods um, and two targets of Buddhist mind training practices, the conceptual and the non-conceptual aspects of the mind. Under the conceptual uh, personal worldview and intention, two constructs that we look at, personal worldview being one's concept of totality, um, that's broadly construed, but, um, and the non-conceptual uh, awareness and attention are the two constructs we focus on. 
So I should mention that at any point uh, in this presentation something's not clear, uh, feel free to ask questions. I did time this presentation, it takes about an hour without questions, so just keep that in mind also. So training the conceptual, um, how does this occur? Uh, and what's the role of one's personal worldview in contemplative development? Uh, from our view, there's at the outset uh, of the path of contemplative development, a fixation on a conceptual self within worldview, um, highly valued conceptual self, in which uh, the rest of the concepts sort of collapse around. Uh, and that narrows worldview and awareness to exclusive concern for oneself, uh, what we call egocentrism. And uh, this might be related to the doing mode in uh, MBCT, if you all from, are familiar with that. And then intentions manifest within whatever limits are constrained by an individual's personal worldview. Contemplative mind training works with many specific intentions, including intention to attend during meditation, intention to carefully observe thoughts and contemplation practices, and intention to be of benefit during aspiration practices. So just to show um, that intention and the conceptual mind are incorporated um, in training the mind. So how does worldview transform and develop along the path of contemplative development? Well, in our mind, it, it occurs a lot from narrow and exclusive to broad and inclusive. So Cook, Reuter, not the first nor the last to uh, point out that human beings actually have a need to create coherent meaning from their experience. And they do, do so um, through this construct of worldview. And uh, if something happens then within our experience that does not accord with our current coherent meaning structure, we experience worldview, uh, experience incoherence. And so uh, that might provoke some kind of anxiety which would motivate us either to change our experience and reestablish the kind of coherence that we had before, to sort of block something out of our awareness, for example, or to shift our worldview, to transform our worldview to be more inclusive, to include that new experience and uh, reestablish coherence in that way. And so in psychotherapy, as in Buddhist methods of training the mind, we are working to systematically disrupt one's habitual tendencies to center on oneself, to be exclusively in the doing mode, and, um, uh, and gradually introduce a broader, more holistic perspective. So uh, in Buddhist mind training, how do we do this? How do we promote uh, worldview development? How do we uh, create worldview experience in coherence? Well, there's a number of ways that training the conceptual mind happens in Buddhism. These are just a few. Within Buddhism, there's whole systems of logic um, that are, are involved in helping one train the mind, to sharpen the mind, such as Madhyamaka. Um, so these are just a few, but aspiration practices being one. I imagine most of us, uh, if we were sitting down on a cushion and practicing with this, this intention, may all beings be happy, we'd have some reservations to begin with. Well, I want most people to be happy, but that other person, I'm not so sure about your enemy or, or your neighbor's dog or whatever it might be. And um, <coughs> so the idea here is that through doing this aspiration practice and just trying it on with our experience, practicing with it, uh, we can gradually introduce and gradually disrupt our habitual tendencies to uh, sort of center on our likes and dislikes and introduce uh, a broader and more inclusive perspective such that we include our enemies even within the circle of compassion. Uh, slogan practices being another one. Uh, these weren't developed by Trump or Rinpoche, but this is his translation. Um, these are just a few slogans, there's 59 in total, but these are just like little mnemonic devices almost uh, to remind one to return to the